Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to another wonderful day over here at the Los Angeles Regional SBDC. This is Sadie Uribe, the Community Engagement Specialist. Yes, I am filling in for the wonderful Lauren Simpson today. I know you'll miss her greatly, so I'm here hopefully to give you a little sunshine as well. The SBDC is a national program with over 1,000 locations across the country, helping to stimulate economic growth through business advising and development. We offer no-cost services to the local businesses through funding provided by the U.S. Small Business Administration, SBA, and from the California Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, GoBiz. The Los Angeles Regional Small Business Development Center Network serves small businesses throughout Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. And we offer no-cost business advising, meaning you can meet one-on-one -on -one via phone or Zoom to address your specific needs and challenges. And we also offer virtual training, such as this concept comprehensive workshop to help and adapt and grow your business. So Lori, hello, it is so nice to see you again. Good morning, Sadie, and thank you so much for filling in to Lauren and those who missed the normally maps and everything that Lauren shows, Sadie got all the information. Now, Sadie, I wanna make a quick technology note. You will have to manually um, allow chat to be enabled on your side. Um, that's something that you control. And so it's disabled right now. Emma, yep. thank you. So much for letting us know and what she emma's a frequent flyer that always watches our back so she just let me know that the chat was um it disabled so we'll give it a try again emma you should be good to go and i want to say welcome everybody and we got another great show so let me jump in quick with what i'm going to be presenting today some facts and things as always and sadie will be putting the information into the chat and just a quick reminder any questions goes into the Q&A. Conversations are in the chat, the party, as we always talk about it. And please make sure that the comments in the chat are specific to the show as well. And uh, let's get started here. So with that, um, I want to talk about first my myth buster and my myth buster. And, you know, I've kind of been on a roll lately as I've been talking about profitability, talking about certain beliefs that companies have, kind of the myths that are spread throughout the small business world. And each time I speak of these topics, it's to kind of let you open your mind to a different way of thinking, because I can see that that thought process either takes somebody down a road they don't want to go down or keeps them going a road that is a good idea to go down. And this is no different. It sounds like a very simple sentence. It takes several years for a company to be profitable. This has become part of the ethos where sometimes I see companies use this as a reason to justify why they're not profitable now, but it's not necessarily true anymore. Now, I'm not saying it's not true across the board, but it's not true for many companies. Let me explain. This statement, this business statement has long historical value. In the days when we were more asset-based companies, think about buying pipelines, putting them under the ground, buying huge manufacturing facilities, all this equipment. It took several years to make an enough widgets where in cost accounting, we would say the next widget doesn't cost as much because you paid for the shop and the equipment. So there was truth that you were not profitable for a while, but part of the startup costs, because you had to fund those through loans, was enough money to pay the owners during this process. Today's companies are mostly service-based companies. And even if they're selling a product, technically they're a distributor because they may have a manufacturer that makes that product for them. Let me say it another way. Very few companies, especially those in California, are investing in these huge plant and um, machinery factories. Therefore, profitability, if you're a service-based company giving your time as a consultant, should be pretty quick. If you're buying products and have to create inventory, a little bit longer. So when will you be profitable depends on the business model. So what I'm suggesting, instead of just saying, well, I'm not profitable because it takes some time, which is a generic stating without the fact, 
look at the numbers and say, what is causing me not to be profitable? When will that change? If the question results in an answer such as I've had to invest in inventory, well, that's more of a balance sheet. So you still should be profitable on the income statement. If it's, well, it's taking me a while to make up enough sales to cover my overhead, well, then you can look at it and say, when will I get there? Do I have too much at overhead, do I have too much capacity for my sales volume? So by asking, why am I not profitable? What will allow me to be profitable? When will I be profitable? It allows you to have more insight to how the business model is performing rather than just have blind faith that profitability will come by default. So that's my myth buster and my comments for this morning. Financial literacy for November is starting soon. Um, Sadie is putting the information in the chat. I'm also adding what is the best legal structure for my company and tax advantages on December 7th. Going to get one more in there because that's been back and back by popular demand. Upcoming shows next week, we've got David Horowitz. He owns Chevrolet Value Management, LLC. He's going to talk about a whole lot of things, some of them raising capital, some of them performance, a, a whole range of information. So I'm really going to let him delve into it. Now, for those of you who have been frequent flyers, you're familiar with Elaine Rodriguez, as well as Clarissa Wilson, two people I've had on the shows before. Elaine really talks about the opportunities as an entrepreneur. Clarissa comes in and talks a lot about QuickBooks. I want to talk about in QuickBooks what you need to know to get ready for the end of the year, what you need to know to balance the accounts, et cetera. So I've asked Clarissa to come on and talk a little bit about that. Okay, so that is what's coming up in the future. Today's show is going to be another fascinating one, as Lauren and I always say. Matt and Karina are a power couple, and that they are, who have always dreamed of owning their own business. You guys can relate to that. After years of working in different industries, they finally decided to take the plunge and venture into owning a campground. Karina comes from a background in property management, while Matt has experience in home building. They both bring their unique skills and experience to the table, and they are committed to providing their guests with the best possible experience. They own Bayshore RV Park and Guest Site Suites, a campground where all people who enjoy outdoor activities come to play and relax. They have amenities for the RVer, tent camper, and three Airbnb units on site. Welcome so much to the show, Matt and Karina. I'm so glad to have you on the show today. Thank you. Appreciate you having us. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Now turn on the video. We want to see your lovely faces. And there you are. So glad to have you on the show today. Oh, okay. hey, your story is everybody's story. And, and one thing I know is your story evolved and kept getting more and more intense. So I want you guys to take us back to where you want to begin. A lot of times I say, tell us about the company, tell us about this. But, you know, I'm going to say, where would you like this story to begin? Why don't you start where you felt it began? Well, I think where where it began is probably about the same spot as 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 most people. You know, you you want things, uh, you you work hard, and you're willing to sacrifice all of your time and and in exchange for money. You know, and and a lot of times you do it for somebody else in hopes that they're going to take care of you, and eventually you start to recognize that everybody's in a business to, to make a future for themselves, you know, and, and it's not a business to take care of all of their employees. So all the time and sacrifice that you make, you get paid for it, but not the same as if you were to do it for yourself. Um, you know, I think one of the big things that I recognized early on, cause this isn't my first time owning a business. And, you know, when I was, when I was younger, I, my first business I started, I was 22. I, I started a, a framing company with a couple of friends and, you know, to go working for somebody else, work in your regular shift, you get to go home at the end of the day and you don't have to really worry about work until you get there the next day. Uh, I think the big misconception early on is that, oh man, I'm going to own a business and I'm going to make more and I'm going to do less. You actually work more <laughs> you you work a lot more and yeah. if you were to break it down at an hourly rate 
uh, it's less than probably you were getting paid before, but the overall freedom of making your own decisions was, was something that, you know, you could become prideful of. Uh, so to kind of jump around, uh, working for other people and, and recognizing that, you know, at a certain point you have to, you have to, you have to really focus on what the goal is, is the goal making a bunch of money is sacrificing all your time for that money, uh, and not having any time to, to enjoy it. You know, you work all day. A lot of people will create a job for themselves by being self-employed, you know, and, and recently, you know, I'd, I'd lost my mom and, and I, I thought, okay, I'll do, I'll do stuff later. You know, I'll, I'll sacrifice all my time for money. Now, uh, I want to be able to provide a good future, you know, for my family, for my kids. Uh, and then time slips away quicker than you realize. And those opportunities are gone. And so we, you know, had an opportunity, this, this RV park came up and we started talking about it. And, and, uh, when we first bought the RV park, what we really thought was, okay, it's going to, going to be another opportunity to create passive income because, you know, over the, the career, I realized that passive income was really where it's at. You know, I read a bunch of those self-help books, the rich dad, poor dad, uh, you know, how to win friends and influence people, the like switch, all these books that kind of led down this path, but it's just the, the time aspect of, of what you give up for what you gain. I, I think, you know, for Karina and I, we were giving up all of our time. And then the time that we had together was you have to plan it. You have to organize it. You have to plan it out in the future. You don't really, you don't really have any freedom, you know? And so when we had the opportunity to buy the RV park and we thought that it was going to be passive income, uh, we'd recognize pretty quickly that somebody else was going to be in control of our destiny for the, the profitability of the park. And nobody's going to care for your business the way that you can care for your business. It doesn't mean as much to them. They're working as a job, you know, and for us, it's our livelihood, you know? And, and so once we lost my mom, uh, it, it kind of just redirected focus on, on what was important. We decided that we were going to work the business ourselves. And very quickly, we recognized that all the freedom that we were going to gain by doing it, that you might work all day, but you get to spend all day together as a family. We get to spend the day with our kids. We get to spend the day together. Uh, she has the freedom to be able to watch the kids, raise the kids, and and not leave that to somebody else. Uh, you know, those those interactions that you get with the customers are a lot more personal experience. It's it's uh, it's a lot more meaningful. They're not just numbers. They're guests. You know, they're they're they're, they're part of the experience and you want it to be enjoyable because it becomes very personal. You know, it's, if, if we do a good job, they enjoy the experience because they can see the efforts that we're putting into it. Right. Uh, right. You know, I'm, you know, I'm glad I asked the question the way I did. Normally I start out and I say, you know, tell me about the company, et cetera. But I had a funny feeling with you guys, because, you know, we've had so many conversations and, and Matt, I know that you represent Matt and Karina both, but you know, Matt and I, we've had the conversation where you represent that kind of buying into a certain belief, trying to follow this pathway, like you said, reading the books and then kind of having a situation happen. You, your mother passed away and then you guys had a baby right at the same time. It was the most challenging time of things happening together, but it really allowed you to kind of view life in a new way. And this, this company, the RV park is incorporating in with this new viewing, this new way of experiencing life. And I want to get into the RV park and the specifics, but right before I do, I just want to ask this question, you know, do you feel, especially, you know, we all experience different things because of our age group, the culture and what we go through at the time. And you guys were at the age where you were kind of like a little bit of buying into what I had been sold when I was born, but also an age group where you could 
do a twist and go the other way quicker than my age group. Do you, I feel as though in my conversations with you before your mother died to after your mother died, you almost did that turn where you said, wait a minute, life's about something different. And I know you just spoke to it in a minute ago, but what would you say was the takeaway or the defining thing that you feel now that maybe you didn't have an awareness then when you were chasing other goals? Life's short. Very well said. Very well said. I, it, it really is. I, you know, I look at my life and I, and I see all those things that I did that really don't matter anymore. So let's get into this RV park. First of all, let's create a picture for our audience, because when they think of RV park, you know, me being experienced in RV park, there's so many different RV parks. And I know most of our audience are probably picking, picturing these little pull throughs and stuff. Bay Shores is a very unique place where it is actually situated. So first, let's talk about what it is situated around and explain the environment that you're now living in. And then let's talk about the mechanics of what you had to do when you buy an RV park, because so many people are looking in the tiny house, the RV park, and they think, oh, you just buy it and you take rent and that's all. And there's so much more to it. So I know I just said a mouthful. I want to create the beautiful picture so our audience sees it and then the challenges of operating it. So take that away wherever you want to go. <laughs> well, Karina has the experience in the property manage management aspect, and I, I kind of rode her coattails on it. Uh, and and really relied on her. So I'll I'll let her talk a little bit about uh, the 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 challenges that she's faced and and how we got off of the ground and and what it was like for her. And then I could jump in and explain how I played a role. Sounds well, good. Well, um, hi everyone. <laughs> so Bayshore, we're located at um, a really small, beautiful town on the Washington coast in Tokeland. And um, it's a small RV park, only about 41 spaces, um, and then three Airbnb units. And so uh, when we first came upon this property, we we came to visit it. And, you know, my first impressions were like, where are we? We're kind of in the middle of nowhere. You know, no <laughs> one's going to come visit us here and no one's going to want to come stay here. <laughs> and the weather here, you know, is not the best especially in the wintertime, it's very gray, gloomy, depressing. Um, but the location itself is a gold mine because there's activities to do year round. And so that was something that I wasn't aware of at the time until I did some more research. But um, yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think the location of the place was like a secondary that you start to recognize after you you realize what you have to do to run and operate the business. You know, I think when we first bought it and we jump in, you have to figure out, okay, how are we going to, how much is our overhead? How much do we have to come up with on a monthly basis? And then you kind of get your feet under you. So it's, you're, you're, you really kind of start building the plane mid flight, I, I guess, you know, because you have a job, you work for somebody and you are task oriented and you know what you have to do for your part of the role. And so when we bought the place, we really had to jump into every task of the role. And we both have experience in multiple tasks, but never really have to run every single task at the same time by yourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, having the space is you, you kind of focus on what is here on the space and then you, you kind of build the nucleus in, of, of the business and kind of get oriented with the nucleus of the business. And then you have to figure everything else out as it, as it expands. Like, you know, we're right on the water. Okay. How can we advertise? How can we market what's on what, what there is to do here? Cause Washington coast isn't historically known for, you know, a beautiful climate and, and all kinds of activities, but the more you actually get to experience it, I think it's one of the most undervalued uh, areas of real estate in Washington. 
-hmm. And uh, it's an estuary, which a lot of people don't know what an estuary is. So <clears throat> as you picture this, picture that you're pulling up into this park, but you're seeing this body of water that comes in and flows out every single day with a ton of birds and lifestyle. It's like a bird refuge almost. And it's right near a the Indian reservation, which means it's a lot of open land. And so it's a beautiful area. But like you said, you know, a lot of our guests on the show, they deal with financial issues, but you have it compounded because you have seasonal. You've got this short window of opportunity to make money and then know the other months you're not going to be as much. And that's a challenge financially as well. So do speak to buying the RV park. How did you do not exact, you know, numbers and calculations, but how did you get your mind around how you were going to make this work financially. And also, Matt, mention a little bit, you had some background in buying and selling RV parks previously. Um, so bring that in as it makes sense to do so also. Yeah. So, you know, when we first started approaching the deal, uh, you know, we had to figure out, well, one of the, one of the biggest challenges with RV parks is historically uh, they're, they're really, really valuable, but the people who are selling them like to hide the value because most of the time they're 20, 30 year owners, you know, or they're generational owners. They hand them down because they can't sell them because historically they're not honest about their income. They feel like they've paid enough taxes to Uncle Sam. They don't owe any more taxes. But the downfall of that is that then they can't sell it for the correct value of it. And so that's where I kind of found a niche in, in an ability to almost kind of wholesale, but it's really assigning. Uh, and so I found a company who was really big on, on their growth. They wanted to increase their capacity. Uh, they had a ballpark number that they like to pay per space. And so then I would go take my trailer to RV parks that I thought would fit the criteria of something that would go under the, their umbrella very well. Uh, then I would start building a relationship with the owner of the park and I would go back regularly, maybe twice a month, every other weekend, I would take my trailer down and visit and just build that relationship and then start approaching the sales talk. Uh, and then, you know, knowing where the person wanted to buy per space, it gave me the flexibility. If they wanted to buy it up here and I bought it down here, then I get all the fluff in between because if they can buy it from here and the bank values it up here, what they'll do is they'll go in, they'll season it for six months, and then they'll refinance it and do a cash out re, a, a, a cash out refinance and move to the next deal. So I would get it under contract and under the buyer name, I would put Matt Galeasso and or a signs. And so from that point, uh, you know, which is a pretty typical thing in commercial real estate because you have to form an LLC. And a lot of times at the very beginning of it, you don't know what that LLC is because it's going to be a partnership potentially and, and find finding, you know, the income to be able to do it. Uh, and so that's how I was initially starting on the path. Well, I was doing that. The company had actually approached to, to hire me uh, in-house uh, and so I only agreed to do it because they were going to allow me to continue to do that as a, uh, as an outside, uh, uh, set of responsibilities. I do that as a, as a 1099, not as an employee. So I did that a few times. And then once I learned how they were doing it and the value that was actually there, I thought, you know what, why, why am I going to cut out the other half of that profitability and give that up to somebody else. And so when we found this property, it just made sense because of the potential that it had. Uh, most of the parks, most of the RV parks, they don't put money into them. They take the money out of them. And so it, you know, having this park, it kind of changed our way. You know, and I know I'm bouncing back and forth a little bit, but I think it's relative. Uh, when we when we bought this park, we thought that we were going to run it from a distance, you know, and then life happened and it kind of changed the pathway. So then when we got up here and started running it, we'd realized that, well, you know what, before we wanted to make all the money, you know, we wanted to make as much money as we possibly could uh, and buy more crap that we don't need that people don't care about, you know? And so uh, it's like, 
you spend a lot of time to make a bunch of money to buy stuff that doesn't matter that you don't use. So then when we got this place and we said, okay, we don't need to live a life of excess. We were talking about it and saying, Hey, you know, we haven't had this extra stuff for a while. Do you feel an impact on it? Well, no, because we have everything we need and all the other stuff was stuff you didn't need. And so when we really started living this lifestyle and putting the money back into the park, it just changed the way that we started to view money because no, now, yeah, now, this is, go ahead. now we're building value, right? So we don't need to have the money. We don't have to have the money because we have enough. We take the money that we need to be able to pay our necessities. The rest of the money goes back into the property because then you're gaining value in the real estate itself. So it's, it's you, you need to pay your bills. You have to have food on the table. You have to have clothes on your back. You got to be able to take care of your responsibilities and your kids and that kind of thing. But you don't need the other stuff. But society has a way of teaching us and telling us that we do in order to compete with everybody else. <laughs> We're not in a competition with anybody else. We're trying to take care of ourselves. We're trying to take care of our family. That's the most important yeah. thing. And see, it's, thank you for sharing that, Matt, because that's the part that I wanted the audience to hear, because guys in the audience, you got to understand that I first met Matt, right? Right when he bought it, he wasn't present. Karina wasn't present on the property. I was on the property staying and I met Matt and he was, he, you know, when I first met Matt, I thought, oh yeah, he's just like the investment bankers in LA that I know. Number guy, I'm buying this, I'm selling this, I'm quitting this hut. You know, that's how I met Matt, right? And uh, then I come back a year later and Matt's on the property and he's working and his whole demeanor has changed. I see this, just this halo of peace around you and you're out there in the property and Karina's there and the baby's there. And it was a complete different experience. And that's when I actually, I told Matt right by the show, I said, you know, I want to have the kind of conversation we had when you were trying to clean out the sewer. <laughs> that's what he was doing <laughs> when I saw him again. He's down in the, you know what, cleaning out the sewer, right? And the year before, I it didn't seem that Matt would touch a sewer when I first met Matt. And then the second year he's there cleaning the sewer and I never seen a happier mat as I did at that moment. So that brings us, you know, I, I wanted the audience to have the benefit of that background because we were kind of dancing around, but once you started talking, they can see where you came from. So you, you had this idea, it was going to be passive. This is going to be just a way to build wealth. And now it's a lifestyle. So let's talk about numbers, Matt, because you are a number person. And many people in the audience have a really hard time figuring out, am I profitable? Am I going to be profitable? Am I going to have the capital to cover expenses? And you have a good understanding of in relative terms. You don't speak over their head like somebody who's gone to business school and all these words. You are very plain, like you got to have money to cover your expenses, got to have money to do that. Was it scary and is it still a little bit nerve wracking to figure out now with this new way that your lifestyle has evolved, how to make the numbers work and how do you deal with it mentally? How do you deal with it financially? financially? How do you deal with it emotionally? Give us some thoughts on that. Yeah. So it was terrifying. <laughs> it was, and that's, that's downplaying it, you know, because <laughs> when you have a job and you're working for somebody, you're getting a paycheck, you know? And so when we stopped working for somebody else, that thought of not getting a paycheck from somebody, that's, that's imprisonment. You know, that's, that's where, that's where you, you get stuck based on the security that you think is really there, but it's not, you know? And so when we weren't getting a paycheck, it's like, okay, well, uh, how are we going to cover this? Well, you have to do them. You got to crunch the numbers and see what is our monthly overhead going to be on this property. And based on when we bought the property, they were, they had like $150,000 a year that they were generating in revenue that, you know, and, and so we figured, okay, well, that is the cost of the business or that's how much the business is making. And let's say that on our peak months, it costs us $12,000 a month, right? So if it's peak month, month, it costs us 12 grand a month, then let's say worst case scenario, it costs us that every month, that's 144,000. So even at $150,000, we know that we're making profit. It's right. not much profit, 
But the thing is, is that when you change your mindset and now you're living here, you have a home here and it's all covered in the same in the, in the same income. It is actually no different than working for somebody, collecting a paycheck from them and paying your bills. Yeah. That's it. That's, that is it. And so when you could change your mindset to getting a paycheck from somebody else to working for yourself and running the business, all you have to do then is make the improvements. So it, it, it a mom pop operation that we purchased have no idea how to handle any marketing whatsoever. They don't, they don't know what social media really is and the impacts that it can have on your business. We, we increased by over 50% this year, our second year. So it's, it's, and and that's having a newborn baby, you know, that's like, and so, so you just kind of really change the way and, and, and your thinking. And, and so if you're going to live a different lifestyle, which is what this is, you have to let go of the other lifestyle expectations you're not there anymore. And that's where we had to really wrap our head around it. And it, it was difficult. It, it was, uh, you know, like I said, it's terrifying. You can't downplay what it is, but you also have to bet on yourself. You have to, you've made it this far. You've done what you've done already because of your efforts. So now all you're doing is cutting somebody else out of the picture. Who is your ceiling? They were the ones capping you off. You go to a job, you work, you have a certain set of responsibilities you're not doing anymore. But if you have a hunger for growth, then being, you know, self-employed and owning a business like this, it is for you, but it's, it is a lifestyle. And I think where uh, the people that I'd worked for before, they want to, they're another one of those companies that want to draw all the money out of it. You know, they don't want to put the money back into it. Then they get a bad name for themselves. Uh, and for us, it becomes a really personal experience. And so when somebody gives us a good positive Google review, you could get a good Google review working for somebody else and that helps their business. But when you get a good Google review for yourself, for your business, it is an unbelievable, overwhelming feeling. And Karina, I know when anybody's ready to Google, because prior to the park, there was just a little bit of Google reviews and everything. But I know, Karina, you jumped on the marketing aspect right away. And also, this is a time to talk about you took over some difficulties with what the park was experienced with previous employees and previous uh, whatever you want to call them. Right. So you had a challenge in the management on what you inherited with the park, if I can say it that way. And then you immediately got on Google and, and you'll, you talk to the degree you want on this, but one of the things I noticed you got on Google and you politely respectfully explained situations without details to let the Google review be read in ways that maybe it would have been interpreted different if you had not responded. I will leave it at that and let you take it from there because I think that there was a certain bit of difficulty in transitioning from what was being seen about the park to the public as well. And that's a marketing problem. Yeah, I think, well, the biggest issue when we had first acquired the property was um, the, the history of it, because this park has been here, you know, over 20 years. So throughout the time, people have come back, you know, every other year or so, and they've always met a different owner, or they just didn't like previous owners, and the quality of the park was just really run down, or the quality of the staff was just, you know, not the best. Um so when we took over, we we had to we had to take o- take over all the social media accounts, kind of rebrand ourselves. We did a, a new logo. Um, we we posted pictures about you know ourselves, the new owners, what guests should expect from you know moving forward. Um, we we responded to Google reviews and um, we just had to put ourselves out there in a way that it hadn't done been done before. And so um, little by little, and, you know, once, once people started coming and, and meeting us, that, that, that's really the big shift that happened on Google. But in the beginning, our, our biggest issue was, you know, staff, we had a gal here and, um, you know, wasn't really the best representation of who we are. 
And, um, you know, the situation that had happened was um, she was going to have like a huge family reunion here. And, um, you know, eventually we just like caught her, you know, being caught her stealing and stuff like that. So we had to let her go. And um, it was like three and a half weeks prior to her family reunion coming. And so we told the family, we're not going to be hosting the family here. Um, We had to let her go. And they were like, I talked to the sister and she was like, oh no, I'm so sorry. You know, totally understand. I gave them like a bunch of options on other places to go. And, you know, then they just started like bashing us on Google. And so our first, you know, thought was we're not going to have somebody who's who was you know not being truthful with us and have their whole family come here and who knows you know if they're going to retaliate so we were just like no thanks and um and you were able to get the google reviews removed right based on explanation of of the scenario and 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 uh because unfortunately a lot of people do shop on google reviews and so if they open up and they see our property and they see negative reviews they don't even give it a chance and so karina having to go in there and kind of clean up some of that previous work that had been done uh so we can actually have kind of a clean slate to operate from was really important and you know so she was able to get through some of that and i had to go back I bring this up because, you know, a lot of times, especially with the social media, it happens to all companies at one point in time, somebody does a bad review. And one of the biggest issues all companies have is how to recover. And that's why I brought this story up because you had to recover a lot. And I want you to keep speaking on it, Karina, but I want to say, I even noticed then you had people on the Google review saying, oh no, there's new owners, right? So they start, yeah. you started having a fan club supporting your new story and and I think there is a lot to learn in how you manage that. So please continue. And even on the old Google reviews that, you know, were under previous owners, I had to go back and respond to those reviews because I know eventually, you know, they're going to get the notification that somebody responded even mm-hmm. from two, three years ago. And so we had to respond to old Google reviews and say, I'm so sorry that you had a, you know, a bad experience. Um you know, please come and give us another chance. We're offering 10% off and um, for, for new guests and things like that. So we do, we do provide an incentive for, for the guests that had, you know, a bad experience and we want them to give us another try. And that's also an opportunity for them to go back and change their Google review. And so when we first bought the property, we were probably at like a 4.2 stars, something like that. And now I think we're at a 4.6 or 4.7. And, and, you know, part of that is that you have to, you have to farm Google reviews. You have to, you got to, you, that personal experience that you're offering to people, you go out and you farm those reviews and you can be bold about it. And, and, and that, that personal experience that you offer, you're not bound by working for somebody else in a fear of how that's going to result. And you see direct impacts of that on your business. I go out there all the time. I'm the one who's Karina takes all the reservations and handles all the stuff, all the computer work, everything like that. And then I'm the one that they see when they get here and I'm sociable and personable and and I like to have fun. I like to joke around. And so when people come here, I will explain to them, Hey, here's some of the stuff. I like to address all the negatives with them right out of the gate based on some of the other Google reviews. Look, we have small or narrow spaces here. And so a lot of people will give us a negative Google review because they don't like looking at the side of another RV. So I don't come camping to sit outside of my RV looking at the side of somebody else's, especially when we are on the water. We have a berm with picnic tables and fire pits. You're up there. And so we want people to have a really great experience. And and we tell them everything that they can do here. They, they, you could go walk out right here. You could go crabbing. You could go clamming. If you want to learn how to do it, I'll take you out there myself. I'll show you how to do it. We've got equipment we could rent for you. Mm-hmm. We want you to have a good time. And I'll tell you what, most importantly, if you do have a good time, we would really appreciate a five-star Google review. Uh, and keep in mind, it is an RV park. I don't know what it would take to get a, you know, a five star or what you would expect to get a five star review. Uh, four star doesn't help us. A four star will take a four point six to a four point five. So if you don't have a good time, just keep your comments to yourself. 
<laughs> well, it's, you, it's you, fun. It's just a fun conversation to have, you know? Well, you know what I think is really important, what you said too, and I want to bring this to clarity. You know, you guys with the RV park, you can't be everything to everybody. You can't have a bunch of big, huge 40 foot diesel pushers come in. It is a small park. And a lot of times, companies want to be everything to everybody they're afraid to say we're not this but we are this small companies deal with that every day and what i noticed is that you guys accentuated the positives like when i came back suddenly you had kayaks for rent you had bikes for rent on the property you took the quaint smallness and capitalized on making it even more quaint and small and clearly stated to others this is what we're not but this is what we are and so it's having that understanding of what you are, what you represent, and what you're not, and clearly communicating it. And I think you guys settled in really well between the Google, the marketing, and then what changes you made to the park to really accentuate what you are and what you're not. Thoughts on that? I, yeah, I definitely agree. The biggest thing was also drawing in new customers or new guests um, with Facebook advertising, um, Instagram, we um, started creating new reels. And like um, using like those platforms, videos. you know, to, yeah. to accentuate those things, you know, and it takes a year to get your feet under you to figure out what's yeah. around you to be able to put the focus on the positive. Because especially during the, the now, I think the generation, like the millennial generation, like they, um, they love camping. They love outdoors. They love the van lifestyle. They love the freedom. They don't want to be tied down. A lot of people are working remote. Um, we wanted to draw in those new people. And so we, we got so many younger, the, younger couples, younger families. I mean, a lot of the the guests that we had were, were, you know, seniors, they had really nice motor homes and, um, which was great, but we wanted to expand our horizons and, and draw in more people and, um, have be more of a, you know, a family friendly environment where everybody's, you know, included and, and, um, so definitely social media was a huge help for us and being more present and posting more, you know, at least four to five times a week, one picture, at least um, videos on your story, just so people stay, feel like we're staying relevant to, to what's happening every single day. That way they, they feel involved and included in what's going on here. Um, because, you know, a lot of the times people come here once a year, so, but it's important to allow people to know what's going on year round for them to, um, you know, like stay a in the know. festival of, you know, firework shows of all the holiday parties that are here locally. Uh, and, you know, we've had people that have come here 10 years, 20 years, 30 years that we can walk out in the water here and pick crabs up out of the bay. Dungeon is crab. You just walk out in the water, wade in the water and pick them up. So once we had learned that kind of thing, we had to show focus on that. And so people are like, hey, I'm here. I want to try the crabbing. I had no idea you can do that. <laughs> yeah. No, I've been dropping pots my whole life. Somebody lied to me. They said that that was easy. But I think it was to give the bait guy some money, you know, and feed all the small ones. Uh, but, you know, then we we really started to focus on on the things that you can do, because when people go out camping, they just kind of associate that with campfires and s'mores and barbecues. But yeah. when you can really take advantage of the surrounding areas, show people how to have fun. You know, that that's kind of what our, our model became. It was, okay, it's a really cool, unique environment with a great scenery around available. But if we can educate people on everything that they could take advantage of while here in the area, it's like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. But at least you show them where the water's at, yeah. you show them what's available, and then people actually start coming back multiple times a year to take advantage of everything when before they only came once a year. Uh, wow. Last year, our first year, we had this couple that would come out here every year. This year, they've been out here five times because they didn't know that you could go out and get clams and crab year round. Yeah, like it's 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 really, really important to you have to immerse yourself in the local culture 
And that's what became really important. You have to, you have to change your views and change your perspective on what the business is and what the goal of the business is. That was like really important too for us is actually, um, it's kind of like doing brand awareness. We're not, I mean, just making people aware of, of who we are and, you know, we're a small family, um, we're running this business and, um, come have fun and hang out with us basically. And so just making people aware of that because people would show up and be like, well, what is there to do around here? Well, yeah. you know, there's this, 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 you know, we would talk about how much fun we have as a family and what we do on a day to day. And, you know, and so people were actually like, oh, okay. I didn't know you could actually do that here. So it's just making them aware of the surrounding. And that's the difference I saw. I started to see people with the Google review saying, you know, thanks to Matt, I learned this. Thanks to Karina. It became a very personal experience. And I know, Matt, at one point you had this saying, I, I don't know if you recall it, you said something about, I, I offer this and this, the fun is your response. Well, remember you said, what was, <laughs> yeah. that? What was yeah. that? That was so cute. What was yeah. that? So, so I, I, I tell folks, you know, that, uh, you know, I came from a home building background and, and I, I've been general manager of operations. And then they had me uh, uh, start a division of the company as customer service manager and build a warranty department. And in home building, it was a really, it was a difficult, it was, it was difficult because over the last 20 years, the evolution of the home buyer has changed significantly. Uh, their expectation, their, their expectations uh, had changed and their entitlement has changed and it just started to really blow me away. Uh, and so here I tell people, you know, I come from home building, that was difficult, but here it's really simple. I offer you a place, our responsibility is to have everything that we say that we have, but you having fun with your family is totally your responsibility. So, I love that. <laughs> so that shouldn't affect my Google review because you can <laughs> have fun with your family. <laughs> I did my part. You have to do yours. <laughs> See, what I love is the clarity. Like um, Brenda just asked, what did you do to increase your brand awareness? And it's really this interaction with Facebook and social media and being real and saying, this is what we have to offer. I mean, you really changed this kind of been some fishermen coming and a few people coming to the park to this being kind of a small family adventure adventure place for people so what we're talking about before we end we got to talk about one more part because people have these like imaginary dreams of being able to run an rv park it's going to be simple there's going to be no problems and one of the aspects that i don't think anybody ever considers of you could find yourself in the middle of a family feud you have to control that this neighbor doesn't like this neighbor playing stereo how do you be fair for all so talk about the way you have to proactively kind of manage expectations and behaviors to make sure rules are met, but not so rule heavy that fun isn't halved. Talk about the need of measuring conflict and managing it, because that's something everybody deals with. Yeah. So I, I like to approach that like head on. You know, if I have a group, older folks like to come in and they want a place to relax and be quiet, but I have to explain to them, hey, look, I want you to know that Everybody is here to have a good time. There's a group, like when we have groups, these people get to see each other once a year. We don't want to limit their fun. I mean, 10 o'clock is the noise that's got to get cut down, but I can't sacrifice the fun of everyone for the one couple who is the problem. I can't, we can't sacrifice the greater good for the one person who's annoyed. So yeah. you can't please everybody all the time. And that's just the fact, you know, you can't please them all, all the time. And so I personally like to address it. Hey, sorry, you know, that you're expecting something different, but this is outdoors. This is a, a place where people come to hang out and have a couple of drinks and cut loose. But at 10 o'clock, we do expect it to be quiet time, but that quiet time doesn't mean shut up and get in your trailer and go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm yeah. very blunt when I talk, when I, when I speak with the customers, because there's no need to like, you know, tiptoe around things. Like everybody is here to have a good time. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the deal. And if you don't like them having a good time, go back in your trailer and turn up the volume on your movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Yeah. 
So, you know, you could see already from our conversations, owning an RV park is like many companies, quite complicated with the real estate and the sewer and everything. What would you say was the biggest shock that you experienced with this new life that you weren't expecting, whether it was a challenge or something you have overcome? What was the surprise that owning or managing daily an RV park was a little bit more than you thought it was going to be? And what was the biggest um, surprise of ease? So let's take both ways. What was the, oh my God, I didn't think this was going to be this challenging. Oh my God, I didn't think this was going to be this wonderful. I think for me, the one thing that was a little challenging, um, so, you know, coming from the property management world, we talk to people every single day. You talk to tenants, you, you know, whether it's good or bad or collecting rent, all this stuff. But here, um, as social as we are, sometimes like our social, what, what would you say? Like the, like we get sometimes like we have to we have to stay on our game all day so sometimes like that is kind of overwhelming a little bit maybe for me more because I have like a kid yeah <laughs> she's she's, baby, she's, so. she's overstimulated most days because of the baby and the need <laughs> yeah, for, for me I I love it I I love I love every part of it and it really grows on you you know because I think the part that was a biggest surprise for me is I'm used to working long days. You know, I'm used to working 12 hour days, but here you get up and you're out walking around, you're milling around the park, you're doing stuff at seven o'clock in the morning. You could be out there until 10 o'clock at night. And then you get inside and you're, you're, you don't feel like you worked a bit in the day because you're just busy. And if you were doing this or doing something else, you're going to be busy. And so it's really about perspective. And so you know, walking around, talking to people, hanging out, doing yard work. It's for me, it's really a dream job. And it it took, it took that time of recognizing that this is my work now. I'm not getting a paycheck from somebody else. I'm earning an income here and my bills are getting paid here by everybody else. And our interactions with them are what drives the revenue. So you want them to have a positive experience. It's, um, it was surprising to see that a 15 hour work day didn't feel like work at all. I've had friends and family come up here and, you know, I'm walking out in the water. I'm going clamming with people. We're laughing, having a good time. I'm showing them how to do the crabbing. You come back, you show them how to cook them, how to clean them. And, and, and it's my friends and family, they say, I'm still trying to figure out what it is exactly that you do for work. <laughs> it's like you're playing all day or doing yard work. And, and that's, it's it's just really kind of changed the way that you look at that we look at things change the way that i look at things and and at any point i could come inside the house i could use the bathroom i could grab a bite to eat i could come in i could tell a funny story to karina about an interaction that i just had or or something that you know you watch people how, try to back their rigs in and, and oh uh, god yes hook their stuff up and <laughs> you know, it's, it's, but we help everybody when, when, when our guests arrive, we always say, do you need any help? Do you, you know, a lot of the time people know exactly what they're doing. And some of the time they're like, this is our first time camping. And, and if know, they're men we though, just bought, if this. they're men, there's a big difference. We don't <laughs> ask for help. We don't need any help. And when we <laughs> yeah. buy our trailer for the first time, like, I don't need to listen to this guy. I'm going to figure it out when I get there. And then you get there and it's, total shock. And so I, I addressed that. I right away, I'm like, Hey, look, I take this from personal experience. I went out, I bought a trailer. I actually bought my first trailer from my dad. My dad is telling me everything on how to do it. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay. You know, and then I get out there and I'm like, all right, what did he say that I had to do? Where do I put the what? And when do I do this? And, and so I, I just address it from a very human perspective like i'm not better than anybody we're regular people i've dealt with all the same stuff that you're going to deal with any mistake that you could possibly make on having a trailer or an rv trust me i've done it so let me help you avoid those pitfalls and when you can take yourself away from being a business and find a way to identify with them they will identify with you as a business unless you do otherwise and so you have to show them that you're a person, we're family. We're just trying to, we're trying to make it through tomorrow. Um, 
and that's that's kind of how we've we've adapted to this. Speaking of being a family, please show us little Sophia. <laughs> oh yeah, she is. Yeah, let's see our the little Sophia friends here. <laughs> Okay, guys, you got to see this cute little face. Hello there. <laughs> she, she was just feeding her, so she got a taste of some milk, and then she got pulled away from it. So she's <laughs> um, another another big thing that I wanted to touch on too is um, using all of the internet avenues on putting yourself out there, even though you know they they take a big chunk. Like for example. Um, Expedia, Hotels.com, especially with our Airbnbs, like Airbnb is just one avenue on on promoting, you know, your your unit. But putting ourselves out there more, um, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Expedia.com, Hotels.com, booking. Enter. Enter. Yeah, um, and I saw someone put Hip Camp. Hip Camp is a great one. Um, all these other, you know, kind of third party places that promote our park, promote what we're doing, um, because not everybody's going to go on Google because not everybody, you know, people like certain apps on where they can find a campground and just promoting yourself through, through all of these different places, because you're going to hit a different group, a different target. Um, a lot of the older folks like, you know, going to, um, the, uh, what is it called? Sam's. Oh, good Sam. Yeah, good Sam. Yeah, good Sam's. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, a lot of the younger folks like hip camp or this other one called the dirt and, you know, all these, all these different places, again, it creates more brand awareness and, um, it creates just getting yourself out there new customers more. and that's something like matt was talking about earlier about the privately held small rv parks they didn't have a big marketing arm they weren't going out to the younger crowd you guys have really come in and taken a different approach than many of the parks do many parks say here i am you drive by you see me no you don't drive by and see you guys you have to know to go there and so you really have um played the marketing well as we get near the end i i want to thank you both for coming on. I mean, I think it's a real interesting story. I'm going to give you my take about how sometimes we go down the road planning one thing and being one person and then life happens to us. And sometimes the worst things that happen can bring the turnarounds to really experience <laughs> And what we what we want to be. And I think you guys are a great story of just taking that ch that challenge and run with it. So um, any last final words you'd like to share with the audience? I mean, it's been just a fascinating discovery of going with the flow. Yeah, I mean, our, our journey has been quite interesting, um, you know, from the beginning until now, like. I wasn't expecting to be here where we are today, um, which is better than, than what I expected. But um, if you're working as a team with your spouse, like make sure to always identify roles, identify roles. That's yeah. really important. We didn't even talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, one thing, one thing, uh, Gary V, I don't know if, if everybody knows who he is, but uh, the one thing that he talks about is that, um, focus on your strengths. If if you're not strong at something, if you put a whole bunch of effort into something that you're not very strong at, best bet, like best thing that could come of it is you might become mediocre at it. Right. So focus on your strengths and become a powerhouse at your strengths. Karina is really good at the internet stuff because when I grew up with internet or with computers, it was the Oregon Trail black and green screen and <laughs> dial up internet and AOL instant messenger was about it. And so then I graduated and I got into framing. And, and so then she was, you know, eight. And so she got, <laughs> and so then she got into the, into the, the, the web stuff. And I, I, I was already past that point, you know, and, and uh, so it's been really hard for me to try to adapt to that world. It's not something that really was something that interested me. I'm a work with my hands kind of guy that interests me. Uh, and so 
I, and I like to talk to people. So I put my efforts where I'm strongest and I continue to get better at those things that I'm already strong at. So I could get really, really good at it. Yeah. And same goes for her. And we don't cross over. Those things don't cross over. Yeah. Understanding roles and also being very transparent with each, with each other. Like whenever there's an issue, like bring it out to light. Don't let anything hide in the darkness because then, you know, if you're like, oh shoot, I'm not going to, you know, tell them about that. I'll keep that to myself. It's like, you know, I, if I mess up, I can't within our business, I know. you know, yeah. and I'm just like, oh man, I'm not going to, you know, tell them it's like, eventually it can come out and it will come out. And it's like, well, why didn't you tell me, you know? And and just remember like your partner, your spouse, like is your best friend. Like you have to make sure that they're up to date on everything and and write things down. And and, and failing at something is, is all part of it. And everything that you yeah. do to get good at takes practice. Nobody picks up a baseball and throws 95 miles an hour perfect strike the first time they pick it up. Everything worth doing takes work and you could constantly get better at it. And I think one of the big misconceptions is that you have to have it all figured out before you go, which causes analysis paralysis. Just get out there because then you'll see exactly what you have to do, what you want to do, what you should do and what you can do. It's all those things are different, you know? So you just have to just take the leap. Just take the leap. It's worth it. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Well, we're going to end on that as we're out of time. I would say a beautiful family, a beautiful story, a beautiful RV park only to be continued. I will be seeing you guys next year for sure. And I want to thank you so much. And Sadie, I'm going to bring you back on to uh, close us up here. Wasn't that a fascinating story? I mean, I love it. It's like, you know what? This is why I love joining your webinar story is because I just get like, I don't think the word is re-inspired, but reinvigorated. And, and it's like, this is like, this is why we are passionate about what we do. You Absolutely. Know? Mm -hmm. Thank you again for Matt and Karina for being here today and sharing the story. Thank you for all of you who have tuned in to Small Biz Talk with your host, Lori Williams. And Sadie, thank you for being here today. We'll have Lauren back next week and I will see everybody next week. Thank you again for joining for another great show. Bye-bye. Bye.